turning your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10. My subject tonight, the gifts of the Spirit bring joy. You know, we have reached Acts chapter 10. We've been going chapter by chapter. But the book of Acts, it is 28 exciting chapters of what the church looked like in the very beginning. And the book of Acts, it is actually a blueprint of what the church should look like in every generation. So many times people say, I believe what my church teaches. <laughs> but, you know, many times that church, it may not be teaching all the truth that's in the word of God. In fact, many churches deny some of the cardinal truths that are in the word of God. And so it's not the church down the street that we're trying to function after, but it's the church in the book of Acts that we want to be a, a, a blueprint, an exact replica of what they were doing. And our church roots, they go all the way back to the day of Pentecost. And the book of Acts is a record of what God wants his church to look like today. That's why this study is so important. I'm going to read part of Acts chapter 10, and then I'm going to look and open up unto you. I want you to see this as you read your Bible, some of the gifts and how to operate these. I, I have handed out sheets on the gifts of the Spirit. I'll mention some of these gifts as we go. But uh, tonight, chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, when we begin that. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band that's called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Verse 3, he saw in a vision. So now we see, you know, visions operating here. Evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and your arms, your giving, are come up for memorial to God. I want you to take notice that when you give, God takes notice of it. It says right there, your prayers, when you pray, God takes notice. Your prayers and your giving are come up for memorial before God. And the angel said, now, send to Joppa and call for one Simon Peter, who is Simon, who is surnamed Peter. He lodgeth at one Simon of Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell you what you should do. And when the angel, which had spoken to Cornelius, departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. My subject, the gifts of the Spirit bring joy. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost here tonight. We've already rejoiced at his very presence, Lord. Thank you that you're always in us. And wherever we go, you go with us. Lord, thank you for opening our ears. Let me speak the words of God with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And the church said in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two major things that mark the early church that I see as I study my Bible. First of all, there are more than 50 different gifts of the Spirit operating in this book. The gifts are operating. They're operating through the apostles, and they're operating through the laity. They're actually operating through the entire church. Secondly, God is using the laity. And they are preaching, and they are evangelizing, and they are operating in the gifts of the Spirit. The infant church did not grow because it had a smooth organization. It did not increase because it had great books to study by great authors. The gifts of the Spirit were in operation. They didn't even have the New Testament at this time. It was being written. So the gifts of the Spirit is what made this church great. And they were in operation, and the church was being led, and it was being empowered by the Holy Ghost. And the amazing thing is this. The gifts were not just operating through the apostles. They were functioning through the entire body of Christ. And that's one thing I want to see this church do is for everyone in the church to start operating in the gifts of the Spirit. It's not just to speak in tongues. That's just the beginning that's just getting into it that's the initial evidence but there are other evidences that are supposed to follow those that believe see the laity was healing the sick as well as the apostles were doing it the laity was preaching the gospel 
along with the apostles. The laity was filled with the Holy Ghost, operating in the Spirit, doing great signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. The great joy was being manifested, and this great joy will always be manifest when people are full of the Holy Ghost. Just think about coming in here tonight. You might have come in here sort of weighted down with the cares of the world, but right now, you felt the dove, I did, when he came in, and you felt things lifted, hallelujah, and you know he's here. Well, we know he's with us all the time, but you know you just came into a corporate anointing, and the Holy Ghost has already touched you. He's already ministered great joy to your heart, and that's why the church needs the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to look at Acts 8 and 1. I'm going to go back and show you some of these gifts, and then we'll get back to Acts 10. Acts 8 and 1. And Saul was consenting unto death. They're talking about the death of Stephen, the first martyr for Christ. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. And look at this, except the apostles. You see that? Except the apostles. You would have thought that they would have been the first ones that went out to turn the world upside down, but they weren't. It says that the church itself was scattered because of great persecution throughout all Judea and Samaria, but the apostles, they stayed right there at Jerusalem. That's amazing to me right there. And a deacon named Philip, he was led of the Holy Ghost, to go to the city of Samaria to preach, and miracles and healings abounded in his meeting. He was a man that was chosen to wait on tables, but God promotes him, and now he's an evangelist down in Samaria, and great joy fills the city. We've already studied that, but what I wanted you to see is point number one, the gifts of the Spirit were being manifest. The gifts of the Spirit were in operation in this man's Philip's life. Look at Acts 8 and 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. This is not an apostle. This is a man that God had promoted to the position of evangelist. And the Lord told him, said, you go down to Samaria and preach to him. And he just obeyed God. And great miracles happened. Look at verse 7. But unclean spirits, demons, crying out with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken in palsy, and that were lame, they were healed. It says that Philip was doing miracles. He was casting out devils. <laughs> the gifts of miracles was functioning, and he was healing the sick. He also had the gift of discernment that was functioning now because he's casting out devils. Look at it. It says unclean spirits came out of them. So many times the healing of the sick is accompanied by the miracle of casting out devils. So the word, the working of the gift of miracles, let me just give you the definition that, that I like to use. This is Lester Summerall's definitions, and I go through the Bible using his definition, and I can just pick gifts of the Spirit out, and that's why I love his definition so good. Everybody else has got an idea, but I, this man is as close to anything as I've seen it. And he got it from his mentor, Howard Carter, and I've got books by both of them. The working of the gift of miracles is when a person supernaturally does something by the divine energy of the Holy Ghost. You do something by the energy of the Holy Ghost that you could not do. When you lead a person to the Lord Jesus, that's a miracle when they get saved. That's the divine energy of God surging into that person. When, when, you, when you pray and you discern a spirit in somebody and lift that thing out of them, you got the discerning of spirits and then casting out a devil. That's a miracle in operation. When you lay hands on somebody, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a miracle. Only God can do that. You can't manufacture that. These are called manifestation gifts. They, they operate as the Holy Ghost wills. And when he sees a heart that is wide open for the gospel and to receive Jesus, and wants more of God, the Holy Ghost will manifest the very presence of God. So the, that gift was operating, and gifts of healing were in operation. It said many were healed, and the gift of healing is when God supernaturally heals someone under an assigned ministry gift. 
There's certain things I pray for. I know I have great power when those are. There are other things that maybe you have that gift. I know I can pray for hearts with great strength because I've been down through that thing. Hallelujah. And when I pray, I have a tremendous faith that just surges out of me. Hallelujah. Because my compassion, it reaches out to people like that. Amen. So the gifts of the Spirit were being manifest through Philip. And what I want you to see, he was a lay evangelist. You know, that's how I started. I started, actually, I started cleaning the floor, cleaning out the bathrooms, cutting heads. I said, God, if there's anything in your church I can do, I'm your man. And I started doing that. And pretty soon I was teaching Sunday school class. Pretty soon I had rest home and prison ministers going. Pretty soon I was sitting in a restaurant one day, and I just eating my, my lunch, minding my business. And a preacher come up to me and said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, I preach when they let me. He said, I want you to come to my church and preach. His name is Sidney Webb. He's my friend to this day. And, uh, but he discerned something. How did he know I was a preacher? I, I remember when I, I, I fasted three days and went to a mental hospital, and I was walking down the corridors of that hospital, and the patients there, you're talking about some demon power. Go into a mental hospital. You'll see some. And I'm walking down the hall, and these people walking there, they said, he's a preacher. He's a preacher. He's a preacher. He's a preacher. I didn't have the credentials. How did those spirits and those people know I was a preacher? Because the devil knows who you are too. Aren't you glad God knows who you are? Go on, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So the gifts of the Spirit were being manifest through this man called Philip. He was a lay evangelist. Look at Acts 8 and 6. Again, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. He's preaching, hearing, and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirit, crying with loud voice came up many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and the lame were healed. You know, it just thrills me every time I see a lay person doing such great things without any certification from any organization upon them. That certification come from God. God gave me before I ever got any credentials. And people in the church, they don't like to hear me say stuff like this. One of them asked me, one of the lead men, he asked me, how does it feel to be a part of the conference now? That's when I got my conference license. And I'm thinking, dear God, I've been pastoring one of your church, been paying my tithe, doing people saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and healed. And you're asking me how it feels to be a part of the conference? Does that little sheet of paper that you just gave me, does that make me a part of the conference? But see, I, I had a big heart for God, and I, I got a Bible, and, and I read John 15, 16. It says, you've not chosen me. Jesus said, I've chosen you. Lift your hand and say, thank you, Lord, for choosing me. I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you ask the Father in my name. See, that name carries power. Not because you got credentials from headquarters, but because you got credentials from the glory world. God laid his hand upon you. I'm not against anything in the church. I'm for the church. I had a man call me today. He said, I need to talk with you. I need to bring my church under the covering. And I talked to him before. I'm trying to help the young man. And uh, so he's finding the lights going on, you know. He knows I need a covering. We all need a covering, amen. We need the covering of the church. But more than anything, i tell you what we need. We need a church full of the Holy Ghost and the fire of God. Amen. You know, it just thrills me, though, when I see lay people doing great things. See, when people realize the power of the name of Jesus, then the gifts will be manifest. Because his name carries power in three worlds. And if you've been born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, you have the authority and the power. I stepped out of the shower Monday morning. I stepped out of the shower just meditating. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And so many people in the church, they're afraid to say, I got power. Well, God says you got power. If you've ever been filled with the Holy Ghost, you've got power. Hallelujah. The devil doesn't want you to know he has that you have power. See, he has power. But you have authority. In the name of Jesus. And then you have the power of the Holy Ghost. The devil has power. That's why people are shooting up on drugs and 
and, and sleeping around and going crazy, amen, while you're sitting in church looking for a blessing from God, they're looking to the flesh. The devil has power, but see, you have authority. Acts 10, 19, behold, I give unto you power, King James, New King, authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So you just got to take your place in Christ and say, hey, devil, pack your stuff up and get on out of here. I've got authority. I've got the power of the Spirit. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So that point number one, the gifts of the Spirit will be manifest. Point number two, the gifts bring great joy. That's why, you, you know, that's why we need the gifts. They bring great joy. Look, look at verse 8, Acts 8 and 8. And that was great joy in that city. Wouldn't you like to go to a church like that? Wouldn't you like to go home and that'd be great joy in your home? Well, come to God's house where the joy is and the joy will follow you home. And guess what? It will spill over your from your cup, my cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'm happy because I'm blessed and highly favored of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So great joy filled the, the city because supernatural gifts of the Holy Ghost were functioning. Not because of, of anything man was doing except preaching the gospel. And the Holy Ghost manifesting the Word of God. Great joy and revival. Think about revival. Revival is always accompanied with great joy. Wouldn't it bring great joy to you to see a family member that was sick, healed? Wouldn't it bring great joy to you to find a, have a, a, a family member that was lost, be saved, and their whole life transformed by the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. So... Point number two was the gifts of the Spirit. They bring joy. Point number three, let's look at some more miracles. Okay, the angel of the Lord appeared to Philip. He's in this city. He's got a preacher's dream. He's preaching the gospel and all these signs and wonders, people being saved and baptized. And the Holy Ghost, the angel comes in and tells him, says, um, go down to the desert. I mean, the angel of the Lord appeared to Philip, and he said, go down to the desert. And he gives Philip a word of knowledge. We don't look at this as a, a gift of the Spirit. He says, go. Now, it's called the word because a word is a fragment of a sentence. When, if, if I taught you about what I know about accounting and banking, you would say, I know all about banking. No, I said, no, I just gave you a word. I know all about Debits and credits and income statements and balance sheet. No, I just give you a word. You got to study to get the rest of it. So I mean, you got to use your faith. You got to do something. All you have is a fragment of it. But sometimes that's all you need. And God will do the rest if you got a word. Hallelujah. But the angel tells Philip, go down to the desert. And there he finds an Ethiopian eunuch. And he's studying the scriptures. And Philip found out that the Ethiopian eunuch didn't understand what he was reading. He was reading Isaiah 53, which is the redemptive chapter, and Philip asked him, runs along beside him. The Holy Ghost spoke to him and says, join yourself to this chariot. That was an entourage of chariots. You know, we think about him riding through the desert on his way back with a horse pulling a little cart, you know. No, this man was a dignitary. There were chariots before him. And church after him, he was somebody. He was the treasure of Queen Candace in Ethiopia. And he's riding on this chair, this dignitary, reading the scrolls. And the angel and spirit spoke to Philip, said, join yourself to this chariot. And so he runs along beside and said, you understand what you're reading? He said, no, how can I accept some man explain it to me? He had been up to Jerusalem. Go read your Bible. He'd been up to Jerusalem. And he wanted something from God, and, and he went up there, and he got nothing. He was on his way back from Pentecost. He got nothing, but he was hungry for God. So God sends this 
lay evangelists down into the desert to get in touch with this man. And he was reading Isaiah chapter 53, and the eunuch asked him, is the prophet talking about himself, or is he talking about someone else? And the Bible says Philip ran along beside that chariot, finally got up in there, and he began at the same scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached Jesus unto him. The man accepted Jesus and was born again. That's a miracle right there, the miracle of the new birth. You know, we miss some of these gifts sometimes. Hallelujah. And uh, then look at, at this. Philip baptized him, Acts 8, 39. He baptizes him. He says, is there anything I believe? Is there anything that can keep me from being baptized? He said, if you believe, you can be saved. And look, he takes him to the water, Acts 8, 39. And when they would come up out of the water, the spirit caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. He takes the gospel back to, to Ethiopia. I mean, this man is saved, you know. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through. He preached <laughs> All the cities till he came to Caesarea. This man's on fire. He didn't have a church sending him. He had God sending him. That's what I liked about Lester Sumrall. Went around the world. And and he no church sent him. A man told him one day he preached in the biggest church out there in Seattle, Washington. And the man was a good preacher. He said, a good man. But he said, they gave me no offering. He said, I, I'm, I'm going to China. And he said, you can't go. So you don't have anybody to support you. He said, God told me to go and I'm going. He said, well, you'll go over there and die then. He said, I'm going. And if I go over there and die, send, send a tombstone over there that says, here lies Lester Sumrall. He died trusting God. Went all the way around the world. Oh, man, you just need to read some of the things God did in that man's life. And that, that man's spirit got in my spirit. I studied. I, I got every book he ever wrote. Got his tapes, his CDs. I, he, his stuff is wonderful. I, I studied the gifts on him. I prayed. I said, God, send me somebody. I, I started late, Lord. I was 37. I said, send me somebody that I can grow. I said, I need, a, I need you to help me. And I thought maybe somebody would come walk along beside me. He didn't come to me that way. He came to me through TV, through tapes and ministries and I, I drove to South Bend, Indiana, to be in one of his camp meetings. I was in Greenville. He came to Greenville. And I said, I'm going. He said, we have a dedicated new sanctuary just coming Monday. And Teresa and I, we just bought a new Mercedes Benz. I said, we going. And I took vacation, and we left on that. We got back from that meeting, packed our bags, and took off and headed out to South Bend. And when they opened up, guess who was there? Charisma Magazine took a picture, and I, I looked at it. was in, in Charisma Magazine of that setting. I said, there we are right there. She said, how can you tell? I said, that's the back of my head. I know that anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but we had a great time. Uh, uh, he was there. Uh, Kenneth Hagin was there. Uh, R.W. Schambach was there. And some great things. It, it was a life-changing experience for me, but. That man, you know, he was full of God, full of wisdom and knowledge. And I just surrounded, got with him every time I could. Went to Israel with him. And people in the church of God, they said, why don't you go with somebody in the church of God? Why don't you go with our group? I said, I don't want to. I want to go with somebody in the word and faith group. I want to learn from the body of Christ. I want to be exposed to more. Hallelujah. If you got, nobody's got a corner on God. Get all you can. Hallelujah. And then ask the Lord for some more. And God will meet you there. But the great, great miracles were happening. Thank God for the miracles. I'll tell you another miracle that happened there. Um, they found water in the desert. I mean, God supernaturally did that thing. If we can find water where I can be baptized and they in the desert, how are you going to find water in the desert? You think God can bring water out of a rock? I read a place where he could. Amen. You think God can supply some quail and fly them in when you need them and rain down manna from heaven when, when you don't know what you're going to do? 
That's the kind of God we serve. Those stories in the Bible, they are illustrations, object lesson, things that we're to grab a hold of. Say, hey, 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 wait a minute. He did it for this one. He's no respect of person. Got to do this for me. Just start shouting, praising God, and release your faith, and believe God will show up, and he will. Hallelujah. Glory. Woo! I, I love this Christian walk. I love this thing called Jesus and, and, and the, the church and, and, and the Holy Ghost power and God doing stuff and supernatural things happening that you can't explain from your brain. I, I look at, I tell my wife, I said, my whole life is nothing but a miracle. I said, I, I, live, I drive miracle cars. I got miracle family. I, got, I live in a miracle home. I pastor a miracle church. I mean, this is a miracle that I'm standing here. I wouldn't have chosen me, but God did. Hallelujah. And I've been here 25 years. Thank you so much, Westmoreland. Thank you for being so gracious to me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I tell you, it was a miracle. Paul, um, Philip was transported 20 to 30 miles away. Now, this Philip, what I want you to see, he was a layman. A deacon. I used to sit in that place. But I was doing the work of an evangelist or, or anything God opened up to me. I said, hey, I believe in the name of Jesus. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I want the church to get on the way. When, when you feel down and you feel like nobody loves you, praise God, go out to the rest home. Or if you can't, they won't let you in the rest home. Go to the grocery market. I saw a man coming out today in a wheelchair, and, and he's wearing a cap. I said, simplify. He said, simplify, brother. A, a, a black man, one of my brothers, we served in Vietnam together. And I said, he said, man, said God sent you my way. I didn't even open my mouth about God. He said, God sent you my way today. I just took his hand and shook it. Woo, glory, hallelujah. He felt something on the main line. Glory. And we had fellowship. I made a friend. I gave him my card. I invited him to church. And if he shows up, that's between him and the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good, isn't he? Hallelujah. Then let's look at this beautiful miracle here. Saul experienced a miracle on the road to Damascus. He would later become the apostle Paul. Acts 9 and 3. As he journeyed, he came near to Damascus. And suddenly there shone him. Round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against these pricks. Now look at this miracle that Saul experiences. A supernatural light shone from heaven with such intensity that it blinded him. He heard a supernatural voice, the voice of God, and he was saved. And then he was led by an individual into the city. Now watch God work. Point number four, the word of wisdom. Let's look at God. The word of wisdom operated through Jesus. Now we don't think, see, Jesus operated in all the gifts. So here he is. He's been crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat, but he comes to this one man and appeals to him. His light was so bright it blinded. I sing the glory of God. I wish I had stayed longer. Y'all were there when it happened at the other church on a Sunday morning. I left my body, and I saw the glory, and it was the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. And I didn't stay long, and I come back. Eula Mae Brantley was there. She, she asked my wife and, and uh, Brother Selby, Edith Seljum, uh, Brother Blue's mother, she was there. And they saw this light all around me. I'm sitting there in a chair, but I'm not there. I'm up there. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and they see this light all around me. And they asked my wife, they said, I wonder if Pastor saw that light that was all around him. I told Teresa, I said, I not only saw that light, 
I said, I did everything but look into the face of Jesus, the brightest light I've ever seen. And I come back, and I've got this new energy in my body, my eyes. I don't wear glasses anymore. I don't know what happened. I wish I'd have stayed a little longer. Maybe I'd be a whole lot younger. Who knows what God would have done? Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. That's the power of God. The quickening, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal body by the same spirit that dwelleth in you. Be healed of all your infirmities. Be healed of all your disease. In the name of Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. What kind of church is that over there shouting like that? All you people that are watching by Facebook Live, come on out here and find out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I tell you, like I used to tell people when I, I taught a Sunday school class years ago when I was first starting out, they said, I wish I could come to your class. I was teaching the old folks class. I said, come. These were young people. I said, come if you want to. And if you don't experience God, I give you a refund. We didn't take up an offering in there. Hallelujah. But come on out to Westmoreland. We love Jesus out here. Amen, church. Let's look at this right here. This word of wisdom operating through Jesus. He told Saul supernaturally the, the future. Look at point five here. Four, rather. Acts 9 and 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise, go into the city. Didn't tell him anything, but arise. Like he told Philip, go. <laughs> arise, go into the city. It shall be told you what you must do. So Jesus told him to go into the city, and you'll find out what I want you to do. Now let's look at point five, another word of knowledge. These gifts, these are gifts in operation. You've got to take them apart. A gift of a, a word of knowledge is when God tells you something in the natural that exists, but you cannot know it except supernaturally. And then a word of wisdom is God gives you the prophetic future. I, I saw my baby. I, I hadn't been saved long. I wasn't even married to Teresa. But I, in all night prayer, I saw her in the hospital, and I saw her holding a baby. And that baby's 36 years old now. She got two of her own. But I saw her, and the devil told me, he said, that wasn't, that was your imagination. I said, you crazy devil, that was God. I said, that's my wife. She was dating some other guy. <laughs> hallelujah. But, but I had seen the glory. Woo, hallelujah. Amen. He that finds the wife finds the good thing and attain it favor of the Lord. Every man in here ought to grab his wife if she's sitting next to you and say, I love you, honey. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. The gifts are wonderful. But a word of knowledge came to a man named Ananias. Now, Ananias is a layman. And the word came to him that a man named Saul was praying. And this is one of the gifts of the Spirit. As I said, it's the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is the revealing of a fact in existence which cannot be known naturally. And many times when we read the book of Acts, we skip right over these nine manifestation gifts. And that's what made the church so great. Well, I go to all these church groups and I don't want to go to another one. If my bishop is listening, I don't want to go to another one. Send me to a, a, a seminary. Send me to a, a, a teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. And I would love to go there. I've had enough church growth stuff. I, I read the Bible. How would they grow in that church? The gifts of the Spirit were in operation. You can grow a business. You can, you can grow a little organization. You can have your basketball team and your football team and your whatever. But you won't get people saved and you won't get people delivered. You won't get the drug addict set free and the alcoholic and, and people that are broken and fragmented unless you have the power of God surging through a place. Hallelujah. Jesus said it himself. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what Jesus said his mission was. And then he said, I've 
called you to do the same thing. He didn't say because you have a position in the church. He said, I have called you, chosen you, and ordained you. And, and we got all these preachers think that they have to do it all. No, I want you to help me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I've got, I finally learned enough to teach people something. So help me. Hallelujah. I'll show you. I promise you, I'll, I'll help you with it. I don't know it all, but I know a lot more than, than some people know, <laughs> and a lot less than some know, too. But I know one thing. I got a big heart for God, and that's all it takes. Go and praise God. Hallelujah. You hung and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. Look at Acts 9, 17. And Ananias went his way, and in the of the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, now here he is, he's afraid. He said, don't you know who he is, God? That man's killing Christians. Now he calls him brother after the Lord straightened his theology out. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way. Now how did he know that God had appeared to, to Paul in the way? But he knows it. Look at these facts. He has sent me, now that's the word of knowledge, that you might receive your sight, here comes the gift of healing, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the gift of miracles. Boom, boom, boom. Gifts of the Spirit in operation. Hallelujah. I, I like to go back sometimes and I say, Lord, I know you did this. What other gift was in operation? What? See, the gifts are like this. They're like links in a chain. And you need all the links flowing together. Hallelujah. I like to tell about, I just interrupt my, let the Holy Ghost speak through me. My daughter, Jessica, she disobeyed her mother. I don't have any young people much that preach to in here tonight. Obey your parents. So this is right. Honor the Lord. Honor your mother and father that it may be well with you. Things may go well with you. Anyway, she disobeyed. Her mother, and she jumped off a little miracle ran that was going, and Teresa told her, don't do that anymore. She jumped off, and she twisted her ankle, and the little girl walked with a limp like this. I carried her to my daddy. It's my spiritual authority. He prayed for her. She still walked like this. I carried her to my pastor. He prayed for her. I'm just going through the chain of command. And I know there's a chain of command in the spirit world. If you ever learn that and learn, let everybody find their position in the body, the body will flow together and function. And so I, I was preaching a revival, and I come home one. I'm a late one still, okay? No credentials from man. <laughs> I think God just got a big sense of humor. That's why I'm standing up here with credentials, you know. But I took my little daughter out in the backyard one night, and I said, Jessica, I said, the Lord's going to heal you. I laid my hand upon her. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. She took off running. Come back. Just child, you know, just a little child running like, and just laughing and come back to daddy. And she's limping. And I laid my hand upon her again. I said, be healed. Run in Jesus' name. She took off again, doing what daddy told her to do. She come back still limping. She got back to me that third time. Watch the gifts kick in. I said, come out of her, you devil of limp in Jesus' name. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. I said, run again. She took off running, and I threw my hand like that. When I did, I spoke in tongues. I don't know what I said. I just spoke in tongues, hallelujah. And I saw my words go through the air. I've seen it twice in my life. And, and when my, the word hit her leg, it hit, hit the ground running free. She was healed instantly. I went back and looked at it. I said, first of all, that was the gift of the spirit, discerning of spirits. I discerned that spirit that, that was binding that leg. Come out of her. Then that was the gifts of healing. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. So that, that was a, a discerning of spirits. That's a revelational gift. Then gifts of healing, that's a power gift. And then I spoke in tongues, and that's an inspirational gift. So there were three gifts out of the three groups of three of the gifts of spirit and that's when I come to realize, hey, the gifts are like links in a chain. <laughs> they flow together. Hallelujah. And you need all the God you can get, and I do too. Because we can't do these things. It's the Holy Ghost surging through us. Hallelujah. My Lord. 
Where was I? Hallelujah. Now look at this right here, Acts 9, 17. Ananias went his way, entered the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared in you in the way, he sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Eight, verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes that it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now because of the word of knowledge, when Ananias reached Saul, he already knew that Jesus had appeared to him. He knew where to find him. He knew what to do when he reached him. It was a city of hundreds of houses, but God said this one house is on the street called Straight, is at the house of Judas, and the man is praying. And this layman named Ananias, he goes, and he laid his hands upon Saul. He was healed of his blindness. He laid his hands on him, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. So there's a gift of healing. There's a gift of miracles. And isn't it wonderful that all through the book of Acts, these gifts are surging? Now, I'm going to – I got a lot more I could give you, but I'm going to just end this thing somewhere. Hallelujah. But I want to look at – we'll go to point number seven right here. We're going to look at – Cornelius again I started with Cornelius and I need to get him back into the subject matter here Acts 10 and 1 there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius a centurion of the band called of the Italian band a devout man one that feared God now that was under the old covenant he was a Gentile and he but he feared God and he wanted to be saved okay and so he believed in Jehovah with all his house. He gave alms to the people, and he prayed. Now look at verse 3. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he was praying, and he got a word of knowledge from an angel. So an angel appeared to him, gave him a word of knowledge. And watch this. An angel coming in saying unto him, Cornelius, aren't you glad that God knows your name? He sent an angel that knew Cornelius' name. <laughs> you know, people say, oh, I don't believe in God. How could you not believe in God when God knows you're lying down and you're rising up? The heavens declare his glory. The firmament show forth his handiwork. Day unto day utter its speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech, no language where his voice is not heard. Hallelujah. Even the elements declare the glory of God. Hallelujah. So, mm, mm, mm. look at verse 4. Acts 10 and 4. When he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He said unto him, Your prayers and your giving are come up for a memorial to God. Now, there are people who never give anything to God, and they wonder why their prayers aren't being answered. If you have knowledge of God's word, and you're not obedient, and you're not walking in the light as God has given you light, don't expect your prayers to be answered. Don't expect your situation to change until you come under the lordship of jesus christ god will work with you when you're a baby in christ but when you hear strong preaching and teaching and god is trying to grow you and bring you out of your babyhood into adulthood in the word of god you must obey if we walk in i got scripture for it first john 1 9 if we walk in the light as he is in the light the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all sin and whatsoever we ask of him, we receive it because we keep his commandments. We do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So if you're going to grow, you, you, you got to obey the knowledge that you have. If, if you don't, don't expect God to, to give you any more. He does not reward disobedience. God does not reward disobedience. He, reward, he rewards those that obey him. Rebellion is as witchcraft. It's like a sin. I didn't, I'm not going to do that even though God said it. You're in rebellion. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And you're asking the holy God to bless your life, and you're rebelling against what he has said? No. If you want your prayers answered, obey God. Walk in the light of his word and say, God, I'm doing the best I can. I want you to look at this word of knowledge right here. Acts 10 and 5. He says, now send a Joppa 
He's talking to Cornelius. Send for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon of Tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell you the things that you ought to do. This man is not saved. He wants to be saved. Cornelius was given a word of knowledge, and he was given complete directions on where to find Peter. See, the angel could not preach the gospel to him. God doesn't allow angels to come and preach to you. God chooses men and women that have been regenerated by the blood of Jesus. Do you know how important you are to that lost and dying world out there? They're just waiting for you. The angel said, send to Joppa. As for a man named Simon Peter, he's staying with a man named Simon. He's a town of animals had. Look at those details. He said, and his house is by the seaside. Well, God knew the, his name, and now God tells him the address of where Peter's staying. Aren't you glad God knows your name and God knows your address? Hallelujah. I mean, this God is able to make all grace abound. Well, I, I got this problem at my house. You don't know where I am, Pastor. Well, God does. God does. He, he, he already knew before you got there. You serve a God that declares the end from the beginning. God already knew when I was in my sin what he had chosen for me. And he knew if I would come in. I didn't know where I would be 38 years down the road, but God did. So I like to think about, about God like this. I've been through some tough places. Everybody goes through them. That's what grows us. How would you know you're an overcomer if you never had anything to overcome? So I look at it like this. God declares the end from the beginning. He already sees you over there in victory lane, Pastor Woody. He sees you in victory lane. And then God, if it were possible, he just backs up. He's over there waiting for you. And he walks you through it. When you go through the fire, through the flood, through the waters, it shall not overcome you. See, all of the Bible, it all fits together. It's wonderful. And, and we're sitting here moaning, groaning, the devil did this and the devil did that. Put him under your feet. Tell him who you are. Quit moaning and groaning and give him a power in your life and, and, and let him make you think he's some great big somebody. Jesus stripped him. I can't say it enough. He brought him to naught. You bring the devil and stand him right there. Say, hey, Mr. Zero, how you doing today? Mr. Zero. God brought him to nothing. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, naught. And then you can tell all the demons behind him, hey, I got authority over you too. The church has authority. It doesn't mean we won't fight battles. That's what this thing is called, the good fight of faith. Suit up. Put on the whole armor. Get full of the Holy Ghost. Let the gifts flow. Ask God for more and more and more. Have a big heart for God. God, have a big heart for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's see if I can bring this thing on down here. Anyway, he was staying by the seaside. And he sends his servants down. Peter's up on the roof, and people, Peter is fasting. We're on a 21-day fast right now. What good does fasting do? It's the noon hour, and the Bible says he became very hungry, King James. Why? You don't become very hungry unless you're fasting. He became very hungry, and a sheep came down, and, and the Lord says, slay and eat, and Peter said, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean. Had all kind of unclean animals in there, and foul. He said, no, not so. I've never eaten un anything unclean. And God said, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed. So the Holy Ghost told him and said, there are three men down there at the, at the gate. They're waiting for you. I've sent them there. And you're to go with them doubting nothing. And he goes into this Gentile's house. And the Jews aren't supposed to go into the Gentile's house. He goes into this Gentile's house. And as he preaches the word of God, the they were saved, and the Holy Ghost fell on that group as they did on the Jews at the beginning. And Peter, he goes there, the whole household gets saved. So look at the gifts of the Spirit. There's the miracle of salvation. There's a miracle of 
they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And then they, Peter goes back in Acts chapter 11. He goes to the Jerusalem Council, back to headquarters. They call him on the carpet for going into a Gentile's house. He said, who was I that I could withstand God? And he tells them the story. He said, and God has given to the Gentiles the light gift as he gave to us in the beginning. So the Gentiles, that's you and me, we got grafted in. Later, this man, Saul, we will pick him up in some of the later chapters, and you'll see how God sent him in Acts 13, 46. He told, he told the uh, Jews that. He said, it was necessary for you that the gospel first be preached to you. But since you count yourself unworthy of eternal life, and people in the church Say, you are so unworthy, you are so unworthy, you are so unworthy. God thought you were worthy. Paul said, since, he told those Jews, since you count yourself unworthy, God has, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has made you worthy. He has qualified us. Every sinner has been qualified through the blood of Jesus to receive eternal life. Jesus said, watch and pray to those Jews that you might be counted worthy to escape the damnation that's coming upon this earth. And then Paul says in Acts 13, 46, he said, it's necessary that the gospel be preached to you, but since you count yourself unworthy of eternal life, I now turn to the Gentiles. That is, amen. And so now the church has been grafted in, and now all of us, we can go and worship God. We can all be saved. We can be filled with the Holy Ghost, and we can operate in the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, they bring great joy. Let us stand. Brother Cooper. my peace. He is our peace. He is my peace. Who has broken down every wall. He is my peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. You need to come down and talk to the Lord. Just come down to the altar. Tell them what you have need of. The altar's always open. We just thank you for the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Lord, you know us each by name. You know our address even. We just saw that from the word of God. And Lord, you're able to make all grace abound toward us that we always having all sufficiency for all things may abound to every good work Lord Jesus thank you for opening the door to the tent into the secret place of the most high that all we have to do is call the chief shepherd's name Jesus and father you when Jesus hung on that cross and cried it is finished you ripped the veil in two from the top to the bottom giving us access into the holiest of holies. 
What a beautiful picture, Lord, of your provision. And you're opening up the secret place. And Lord, in a world where there are problems, difficulties, sin, you said where sin did abound, grace does much more abound. Oh, God, thank you for your grace. You said my grace is sufficient. And in your word declares you have received grace upon grace upon grace. Thank you for your amazing grace. John Newton got so excited about it, he wrote a song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Glory to God. Thank you for your peace. Sing it, Brother Cooper. our peace who has broken down every wall he is our peace he is our peace